May we bow our heads in prayer. (coughs) Gracious God, may we have hearts and minds ready and eager to receive your word to us this morning. In Jesus' name, Amen. 2 Samuel chapter 7 begins with these words, After the king was settled in his palace, and the Lord had given him rest from all his enemies. Just stop for a moment and think what those words mean to David. He was the youngest of eight sons, a shepherd. This was a man that had spent more than half his adult life on the run as a fugitive, in fear of his life. A man who'd fought against incredible odds, faced many enemies, and he was, at long last, settled in a palace as king, and he is safe from his enemies. Talk about good news for David. We're here at one of possibly the highest point of his life. Now, sometimes such occasions can be a real source of spiritual danger. When all seems to be going well in our lives, there's a real danger that we stop looking to God. We lose that urgency, that vitality in our Christian lives. It's a bit like in the story that Jesus told about the sower and the seed, where he talked about some who hear the word, but the deceitfulness of wealth and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. There are lots of people here this morning, and sadly, lots not here this morning. People have been through one of our Alpha courses or through confirmation classes, and by and large, people respond with great enthusiasm. Many things are sorted out for them. They're positive about life in general and following Jesus. But then when life is good, it's so easy to get busy with things, to be distracted by our leisure and our comforts and possessions, and we lose our spiritual drive. And that's one of the big problems we as a church face. People who've lost spiritual energy and enthusiasm, somehow... They've got weighed down by a host of other things. Many of those things, pleasant enough. But spiritually, the result is disastrous. All too often, people who've been well-blessed find themselves with no real desire to use this for God. But David, he sets us a great example in this passage. Things are at a high for David, and what does he want to do? He wants to do something really positive for God. He wants to throw himself heart and soul into pleasing his God. And so he has this plan for building God a magnificent temple to house the Ark of the Covenant. The Ark of the Covenant, which we saw a few weeks ago, was the symbol of God's presence with his people. At present, the Ark was housed in a tent. But David wants to put up something far grander. Again, David does the right thing, and he asks for advice from Nathan, the prophet. And Nathan says, great idea, David, go for it. But afterwards, Nathan has a troubled night, and God tells him to advise David very differently. It's a good reminder that even the most decisive of prophets can get things wrong. And basically, God says to Nathan, no, no, David's not the one to build me a temple. God has never asked for a permanent structure. God will choose David and make his name great. Israel will be at peace and God will establish a house for David. David's son will be the one who's allowed to build a temple. The Lord will guide and correct David's sons. David's house, David's kingdom will last forever. So I want to look first of all at why God refuses... David's offer of building him a temple. Later in his life, David tells his son Solomon that God had informed him that it was because that he, David, had shed so much blood 
that that was the reason he shouldn't build the temple. The temple should be a sign of peace. It shouldn't be built by someone who was so associated with war. But I don't think that's the whole story because there's hints of other things as well. Part of it was in the way that David was viewing God. David was now in a position to enjoy the benefits of a more settled life. And in a sense he wants to share those benefits with God. And it's a good thing to want to do things for God. But it's not so good if we think that we're doing God a favour. As though God is somehow in need of our resources. Sometimes in the Old Testament God has to remind his people that actually he's the Lord of heaven and earth. All things belong to him anyway. In that sense he has no need of anything that you and I can give him. There's something not quite right in David boldly saying to God, I'll build you a house God. The right relationship is being reversed. God should be the subject of that sentence. And so God doesn't let David build him a house. Instead, he promises to build David a house. In the sense that God says that the kingdom will stay with David's family forever. And shouldn't the idea of a temple had come from God? After all, God is not shy about saying how he wants things done. We've got 14 chapters in the book of Exodus that give quite clear instructions. God telling Moses how and where he's going to dwell with his people. How the Ark of the Covenant is to be housed. And God says to Nathan, did I ever ask any of the rulers, why have you not built me a house? Perhaps also God liked that symbolism of a tent. It implied a certain mobility. God wanted to be seen as on the move, able to act in different places, not tied down. Whereas it's almost as though David, with this move, wants to tie God down to his capital city, to his political structures. I've settled God and I'd like you to settle down with me. It, it almost smacks of taming God. And I certainly think that the Christian church is a little bit guilty of this. We've built wonderful church buildings for God. And then a sense locked him away in there. We expect to come and visit him at 11 o'clock on Sunday mornings. We're perhaps less enthusiastic about him visiting us at nine o'clock at the office or at the school gates in the afternoon or at the pub in the evening or the golf course on Saturday morning. Now, I don't want to be harsh on David's motivation because there's certainly a lot of good intended here as well. As later his son said to him, the Lord said, The Lord said to my father David, Because it was in your heart to build a temple for my sake, you did well to have this in your heart. And David, he coped with the refusal very well. It's not easy to have in your heart something that you really desire to do for God and then to be told you can't do it. Those who offer themselves for the ministry or as missionaries and then are not accepted find that incredibly difficult to cope with. Feels like a kick in the teeth. You make yourself vulnerable by offering, offering your life to God. You're trying to give your all to God and then you're rejected. It's hard to come to terms with God's lordship. It's not what we can do for God. It's what he can do for us. What matters most is not my plans for God, but his plans for me. And David doesn't sulk. He responds with a humble heart. When he learns that another is going to be allowed to build the temple, he doesn't go off in a huff. Instead, he does his very best to help. And we read in 1, Chron 1 Chronicles 29 of how David, with all his resources, provides for the temple. He gives sacrificially so another could build the temple. Perhaps it's not you who will be the minister or the missionary or the great evangelist or the tremendous pastor, even though secretly you would have loved it to have been you. 
But you can do a great job in preparing the way by prayer, by giving generously of your time, your energy, your money in support. And let's remember that particularly when as a church we support certain charities and missions. Now you could say God made it very easy for David to swallow the bitter pill of not being allowed to build the temple because God gave David such an incredible promise about building David a house. But again, let's learn from David in this passage. There's a tremendous humility here. It's almost the way a child speaks as we read in verse 20 of chapter 7. What more can David say? He's utterly overwhelmed by the generosity of someone who is so much greater than he is. He begins his prayer by saying, Who am I that you should do this for me? Already, Lord, you have done so much for me. Is this your usual way of dealing with people? How great you are. There is no one like you. What a, what a tremendous prayer. I hope that's a prayer that the words are not far from your lips. Who am I that you should do this for me? Already, Lord, you've done this so much for me. Is this your usual way of dealing with people? How great you are. You see, David knew that there was no way he deserved all this. He knew that he'd committed many sins, made many mistakes. He knew that he was just like Saul and he didn't deserve to have the throne. And yet God treats him in such a generous way. And David's words should be our words because... God has not given us what we deserve. Instead, he's heaped blessing upon blessing on us. Blessings just as great, if not greater, than those he gave to David. After all, God has promised to forgive all your sins, to be with you forever. He promises to live in us. He promises that our bodies will be his living temple. He promises that we will live with him forever in his house. There is no one like you, God. How great you are. And David knows that the promises God gives him are a blessing for the benefit of all God's people, not just him. And we should know that when we're blessed, it's a blessing we're to share with others, so that others may benefit. Just one final thing to notice, is that towards the end of David's prayer in response to God's blessing, David claims all the wonderful promises God has made. He prays, do as you promised, God. Keep forever the promises you have made. That may sound a bit strange to our ears, but it's something that's good to do. It's good to claim God's promises. For example, when we find ourselves troubled within, let's claim that promise of Jesus. My peace I give to you. When you don't know what to do, let's claim that promise of God. I will instruct you. Let not these wonderful promises that are there in the Bible stand gathering dust on our shelves. Let's live in the reality of those promises. Let's claim those promises day by day. Well, our next song that we're about to sing encourages you and me to be overwhelmed by what God has done for us. And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Let's sing. <laughs>